Assalamu alaikum dear viewers, peace be upon you all. Welcome to our show discussing the different aspects of the story of Ashura that took place in the <coughs> desert of Karbala. Today's episode, we're going to focus on the aftermath of Ashura, particularly looking at the treatment of the women and children who were taken as captives after the massacre took place. It was a very testing and a very painful time and often an aspect of the story that is possibly put as secondary to the story of Ashura itself. To shed light upon this topic and to further the discussion, we've got our guests, Sayyid Ali Nawab, as well as Ibrahim Ansari, to provide some poetry and add to the discussion. Sayyid, now I'm going to start before the actual events that happened. Um, when we mourn for 10 days up to Ashura, many communities take some kind of break and stop mourning, um, maybe for a few days or for a few weeks till the Arabayn comes up. Um, other communities, however, carry on mourning. M my question is, is that why is it so important to not stop on Ashura, the day of Ashura, and actually remember this, even one could say a bigger tragedy that happened afterwards because there are no defenders. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, alhamdulillah rabbil alameen, wa sallallahu ala Muhammad wa alihi al-tayibin al-tahirin. Allahumma sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. ولعنة الله على أعدائهم أجمعين من الآن إلى قيام يوم الدين. It's a very good and important question. Is that why is it important to continue mourning the martyrdom of Imam Hussein عليه السلام and the tragedy of Karbala and what befell the holy household of Abu Abdullah al Hussein on the land of Karbala? And uh, obviously, when once when we, once we come to look and research about the events of Karbala historically, we find that everything started on the day of Ashura. Some tend to believe that okay, we mourn, we wear our black clothing from the first of Muharram until the tenth, and the Imam is uh, in that brutal manner uh, decapitated, and we. Uh, at the end of uh, the afternoon of the 10th of Muharram, everything finishes, as it is unfortunately in some parts of the world today. Uh, but it's very good to understand, as I said, that everything started on the, on the day of Ashura. All the calamities, all the masaib, all the problems and tragedies started on the day of Ashura. Ahlul Bayt alayhum salam, okay. They say mm. as stated by mm. Imam Al Jawad or Imam Al Sadiq alayhi salam, when they used to see the crescent of Muharram, they were never seen in their uh, joyous uh, status. But uh, everything is added until the conclusion happens on the day of Ashura. So when the Imam actually passes away, the body is decapitated and then the attack happens on the tents and the camps of Imam Hussein alayhi salam. And the, the start of the captivity of the women and the children of Imam Hussein alayhi salam, it, itself it's a tragedy. For them to be taken as captives itself is a tragedy. Maybe as you said, greater than the tragedy of Imam Hussein alayhi salam. So it's very important that in Ahlul Bayt alayhi salam in the months of Muharram and Safar they mourned. Yes. And the greatest uh, example we can take for this where it shows the wider image outside Muharram and Safar rather for the whole of the year where Imam al-Mahdi ajjarallah ta'ala farajahu sharif in Ziyarat al-Nahiyah Says, mm -hmm. 
صبحا ومساء ولا اندبنك صباحا ومساء so there isn't a time limit but it is us we can't uh, force yes people to mourn for the whole of the year although it is compulsory uh, we have ulama who is to start their lessons every day during the year with the masaib of imam hussein or masaib of ahl al-bayt it's good to remember imam hussein every day even if you don't uh, you know wear black or yes just remind yourself because Everything exists because of Imam Hussein. And I know there's uh, one, one scholar I believe I heard that even before every single salah, he says, Peace be upon Imam Hussein, because without him, there's no salah. Without salah. the mention of Hussein, mm-hmm. without the sacrifice of Imam Hussein, there was no salah. Yeah. I, I, like in my community, um, I come from the Indo Pak community, and we, all, we have two months, nine days, which till Nine Rabi Lawal. Yes. Um, there's morning, and some centers do actually a majlis every single night for two months, nine days. Ibrahim, in your experience, why why do you think it's so important? Have you seen um, whilst growing up and even now that the 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 passion dies down after Ashura, whereas in fact it must continue for, for uh, you know at least till for the next few days when this calamity happens to the women and children. One narration summarizes it all, which is first of all that actually two narrations I will mention. The first of which is that Imam Zainul Abidin, there would not be any food or any water served to him unless he mixes it with his tears. Mm. One of the companions of Imam Zainul Abidin, he comes to him and he says to him, Oh Imam, why is it that we still see you in this state? Yeah. The Al-Bayt have the greatest of patience. He replies to him with this. He didn't say because my father was beheaded in a cruel way. He said to him, have you ever heard or seen of a lady from the progeny of Prophet Muhammad or Imam Ali Mm. taken as a captive before the day of Ashura? This is the true tragedy. Mm. Sayyidah Zainab and the woman taken as captives Mm. to Karbala. Even Imam's talking about that, yeah. The Imam, this is what he's crying about. Mm. Imam al Rida or Imam Sadiq actually, I believe. He's, he, he stands and he watches his house being burnt and he sees the woman running between room to room and the companions see him crying. They say to him, the next day they see him crying. He's, they said to him, is this the first time they have burnt your house, mm. O son of the Prophet? Of course, referring to the house of Fatima al-Zahra as well. Mm. Why is it that we still see in this grief? Mm. He said to him, I remembered my, <laughs> my auntie Zainab. Mm. This, mm. it stayed with the Imams. Say, yeah. so, now let's actually focus on the actual events. So we've done Ashura, the tents have been burnt, jewelry's been looted, and they are now have been tied up. Um, I have two questions, in fact. Can you describe just some of the things that the, the army of, of uh, Yazid did? And secondly, um, more of a moral question as such, even in the West, we have exceptions for women and children. Um, if you've seen things like Titanic, when the Titanic is sinking, the priority is given to women and children. And it shows that the human being does have some kind of compassion for women and children, um, as we must, we must defend them sometime. Where was this compassion, where did it go? How can a human being go to the stage where they're able to poke, throw stones, burn women and children who are at that time the most vulnerable people. So what happened and how does a human being get to this state? Of course, um, to recap on some of the things that happened yes. to the women and children, only a minute amount of narrations of the actual happening have we have received through Imams of Ahlul Bayt and that was done intentionally. Mm. So the Imams intentionally advised their companions and their family members not to convey the full extent of what happened on the day of Ashura. Fear over the death of the Shia. Wow. And as I said, what we have and what is recited year by year on. Uh, every Muharram is 
a repeat of just a minute amount of narrations received from Lady Zainab and Imam al-Baqir Imam Zain al-Abideen and the little children of Imam Hussein and some of the, the reporters that were present on the land of Karbala during those 10 days. Mm. But what we understand from the riwayat of Ahlul Bayt as, as what exactly happened uh, is that uh, until the last moments of the life of Imam Hussein alayhi salam, even when he was lying there on the plains of Karbala, his main concern was to keep away the, the army of Bani Umayyah from the tents and from the women and the children. And he was always speaking mm. to the army or to those who had surrounded him in that location. Uh, al maqtal uh, where he used to tell them as long as i am alive keep your soldiers away from my tents and when he himself went to the river of furat to get some water for the tents and for himself to drink some water as he was about to place the water in front of his face to stop him from drinking, one of the men from behind, from the army of Amar ibn Sa'ad, said to him, are you going to enjoy that drink of water yeah. and the army is attacking your women, your the tents and the children? Of course it was false, but they wanted in any way to stop the water from yes. uh, being taken from the Imam alayhi salam. So the Imam's concern at all times, not only the Imam, Abu al-Fadl al-Abbas, the family members of Imam Hussein, the companions, was to keep and protect the women and, and children as, as much as possible. Because if the, if the men are present, then they can defend. But the women and children, how can they stand in front of these yes. fierce men who are you know, dressed in their army clothing with their big swords and shields and they come and their aim was to annihilate the family of the Holy Prophet. Of course, the women and the children, the immediate family members of Imam Hussein alayhi salam, they knew everything. Because it was planned for this to happen. So even before, just between two brackets, even before the birth of the Holy Imam, Imam Hussein alayhi salam, Rasulullah prepared everyone yeah. for the events of Karbala. So everyone present in Karbala, they were part of a plan and they knew their position and what they had to do. So the women and the children of the family of Imam Hussein, they knew exactly what is going to happen to them. And the army of Amar ibn Sa'ad, they were so fierce and they were so violent to an extent that they did not, there wasn't anything left for them to do. Wow. But Imam Hussain in the final stages and the final moments before he left towards the battlefield came and bid farewell to the women and children and the Imam did speak this wonderful statement that gives it all to the women, calms them down a little bit. He told them, In Allah hmm. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is going to protect you from these people. The Imam did not say that these people are go not going to hit you, those people are not going to loot your tents, those people are not going to slap you, or they're not going to whip you. The Imam السلام, stated in terms of uh, physical abuse. Physical abuse where they are going to get so close to the to the women and children of Imam Hussein alayhi salam to abuse them physically. In our daily terminology, to abuse someone physically is to, God forbid, um, uh, rape them or attack them uh, sexually. So the Imam alayhi salam said the statement that they will hit you. Mm. They will slap the little children. They will loot your hijab or they will loot your your tents, but in that manner they are not going to because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala miraculously is going to protect you. Mm. It, it won't take your honor as such. And not take your honor because it's very difficult. I mean, the, 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 the angels will never be able to, to stand their watch mm. that the, 
the sons of Haram come so close to the mm. women and children of Imam Hussein. Mm. But other than that, Imam told them. He placed his hand on the heart of Lady Zainab and he said, Oh Allah, grant her patience. Wow. Because what is going to happen after me mm. is much greater. Mm. And we'll, t we'll, we'll touch upon this uh, afterwards about how they did remain patient. Um, as per the usual format of the show, we're going to have some poetry recited uh, by <coughs> Brother Ibrahim um, about the topic of the women in Karbala. Please. Uh, two very short poems written by Basman Ansari. The first, the story of Karbala is full of pain. It doesn't end with the beheading of Hussein. His family and children were put in chain, but like him, Sister Zainab refused to deign. Zainab had to be emotional yet firm. Through her stance, she resisted the tyrant's term. Hussein was victorious. She had to confirm her resilience was the way to reaffirm. The second, suddenly Zainab had to lead. While watching her brother bleed, Hussein was beheaded by greed. The enemy didn't hear her plead. Women and children to her run. The army frightened them for fun, kept them thirsty under the sun. Burning and looting had begun. She came to Zain al Abidin, you're our refuge, Imam and Deen. He ordered them to escape the scene, knowing it will last till Arba'een. Mm. Knowing it will last till Arba'een. Beautiful, thank you. And sticking with you, Ibrahim, um, could you describe what happened? Between Ashura and Kufa, <coughs> those two periods in time, which, which moment for you, and I know they're all tragic, breaks your heart the most in terms of what happened to the women or the children? That's a difficult question. To Very ask. difficult. So between Ashura and Kufa, we are talking about straight away the night of the 11th and um, until possibly 13. Yes. Um, you see, I'm, I'm going to mention, I, th I think I'll mention two. The first is when uh, they started to burn the tents and they were asking, um, and, and they saw Sayyidah Zainab as she walked um, between them and she tried to um, put down the tents. And that is a very powerful scene actually to even think of. Mm -hmm. um, and the second of which, the reason I'm just mentioning them quickly is because I don't want it to get no, too emotional. Yes, um, the second of which is uh, the actual entrance into Kufa. Mm. Um, this, this, this entrance that every time you read the narrations about it, it's, it's something that will truly break your heart because especially when you know the true status that Sayyidah Zainab had and the disrespect that the woman had to see as they were walking into Kufa with stones being thrown at them. And you know, there's some Arabic poetry um, and and the, they recite it in in Masaib Shmal and Nas Titfarraj Alena. Why is why are people looking at us in this way? Yeah. Why why is it that they are disrespecting us in this way? And when you truly know the status that these women had, and the disrespect they saw, that truly breaks the heart. Mm, absolutely, uh, Sayyidna, going for now, I'm a. I want you to expand upon a point you said earlier about the Imam told uh, Sayyid Zainab in particular that to remain patient and he prayed for her uh, and, and whatnot. Um, now, f genuinely speaking, and if we put the, the prayer to one side and Allah's protection to one side, as a human being, how did the ladies and even these young, young ladies as well actually remain patient because we've described what happened to them and for any person that would break them, um, just mentally, uh, forget physically, how is one able to not just you witness Ashura, but then to have this happen to you uh, for several days? How does one still keep their faith in God? So it says, being a human being is very difficult to answer this mm. question. Taking examples from our daily lives, where um, just through, let's say, a, a normal traffic, road traffic <laughs> accident, they would bring in specialized uh, individuals from the Met Police or from the mm. ambulance service or uh, 
uh, specialized and uh, uh, received training for uh, traumatized individuals. And they stay with them for, for maybe days, trying to calm them down and, and use their experience to um, take that fear away from them. Now, for you to come and say that a three-year-old daughter of Imam Hussein alayhi salam, I try, try. An army soldier with with the armory running behind the three-year-old daughter of Imam Hussein. After seeing what she saw, of the least we can say of blood. Yeah, a little girl seeing blood is itself enough. But to see the head of her father go on top of a spear and to see the tents being burnt. She has no father to run to. And her auntie and her only hope is just looking, doesn't know what to do. And this man is running behind her thinking that he's going to kill her again, like her father. How did they become patient? I don't know. Other than that, I can say it's something that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had placed upon these individuals to keep them steadfast for the sole reason that they have a message that they have to accomplish. Little Ruqayya had a message. And what happened to Ruqayya in Sham itself was a pulpit Imam Hussein alayhi salam had prepared to continue. And all of this, brothers and sisters, for you to know that Imam Hussein alayhi salam, as promised by his grandfather, by his father, by Archangel Jibrail in the last moments, they came and promised Hussein, oh Hussein, you still have time to not back away, but you still have time to say to oh Allah, oh Allah, I don't want to be killed in this manner. I, I can't see my women and children being taken as captives. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not going to lower your position. You will still have your position. You will still get your reward. But Imam Hussein alayhi salam chose for this to happen. And their sole reason was Islam. But unfortunately, some some individuals come today and take Islam and the message of Islam for granted. Yeah. Forgetting what Imam Hussein and the children of Imam Hussein had to go through for the sake of this message. Mm -hmm. And this message only wants the happiness for us. Mm -hmm. We don't want anything from you. Imam Hussein alayhi salam does not want anything from you but to obey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And at the end, you are going to be the winner. So how did the women and children of Imam Hussein be able to hold on in the is out of imagination no one can actually come and imagine mm -hmm. how a woman a female who allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has said through the ho the statements of the holy prophet al mar'atu rayhana la biqahramana the, the woman the female is is like a rose it's like a uh, plants where you should take care of, protect, mm -hmm. not allow wind to come and take her left, mm -hmm. right, and center. Mm -hmm. I think with um, just to draw out something from what you said um, and how they endured, just to just to make us comprehend. I think um, what is fascinating when I when I think now is that the women and children had cognizance of the bigger picture. And to have that at that age and that, that stage where you're going through is to, no matter what you're going through, there's, there's a bigger picture. And I think, Ibrahim, just a, a point for you to make. Oh, sorry. Just before we please. go to Ibrahim, just wanted to make the following statement is that Ahlul Bayt, alayhum salam, age, of course, they are yes. humans or in the position of humans, but age doesn't play a role in their Absolutely. understanding and what of they the provide. World, yeah. So even if we say the three-year-old Rukaya or the six or five-year-old Sukaina, that age mm. doesn't control their intellect and what they can provide and how they can speak. I mean, if a baby Jesus has that cognizance when they're born, then ah, it ah, shows. Ah, if God ah, gives you that insight, ah, age does not matter. So mm. um, intellectually, they were all on, on the same, same page. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Even to echo what Sayyid yes, is saying, 
is Imam Al Baqir. He was yep. present yep. in the land of Karbala. How how Maybe old? Five 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 five. five, of age? five. Yeah, five. A lot of the narrations yeah. we get from Imam mm. al Absolutely, yeah. And I did, I did want to ask you because I want to, um, I want to try and get some practical lessons for for the viewers as well. Because even though I totally agree, this is beyond our understanding. Um, what I was saying is that the, the the women and children saw the bigger picture, and it seemed to, it seemed they wanted to make a bad situation and see the good in it because they saw the future in the in the sense that I'm going to go through this suffering. But I know, I know in the future it's going to be okay, which is maybe why say the Zainab said, I see nothing but beauty uh, in the sermon, which will have not another episode on itself. Um, in terms, Ibrahim, for, for our viewers and as lessons, what is the importance of seeing good in bad situations? Because when you are in bad situations, it's like you're drowning sometimes in this, in this calamity that one upon the other. What's the importance of mentally and physically seeing good in all situations? Um, you see, um, there's, there tends to be a rise, especially even in um, uh, the mental state. Uh, depression is rising, uh, mental uh, illnesses are rising. Um, this is because of, of negativity uh, and, and the extra kind of negativity that is added to every situation. Um, a way to tackle it, a very easy way to tackle it, or easy to say, but to, but to apply, inshallah. Uh, is uh, dhikrullah yes. and dhikrullah the remembrance of Allah and we, and we read in the Quran Allah with the remembrance of, remembrance of Allah the hearts um, stay calm the Prophet sallallahu uh, he, he says that dhikrullah isn't just saying alhamdulillah and subhanallah although that is part of it this is the narration he says, it isn't just saying Subhanallah wa alhamdulillah wa Allahu Akbar, although this is part of dhikrullah, but dhikrullah is to actually remember Allah and what He has made halal and what He has made haram. Okay. When we stick to what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has um, given us in terms of guidance, it will help us mentally, physically, and even Imam Hussein Ali of the Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and we're remembering him in these days, he says, la taraka alayha raqiba. How powerful. May your eye be blinded that doesn't see you. Um, seeing over it. Yeah. So knowing that Allah is always with us, knowing that Allah is over, always overseeing our um, actions, what is going on around us, will always cause us to have some sort of itma'inan, which is why Sayyidah Zainab, like you beautifully said, when she, asked how, when, when she was asked, how did you see what Allah had done with your brother? She said to him, I saw nothing but beauty. And an absolutely beautiful point to finish on. We would like to thank our viewers for watching at home. An absolutely fascinating episode where, and a very difficult one to describe in terms of what happened because at the time the vulnerable people of society were brutally treated. And I asked a question earlier, how can a human being stoop to the level where they can physically attack women and children? But then I think to myself, if you're willing to throw an arrow at the neck of an infant baby, then the possibilities are endless. We're going to end as per usual in the format of the show and the tradition of mourning <coughs> this tragedy with a eulogy recited by Brother Ibrahim. So please, Brother Ibrahim, can you recite a eulogy for us? Eulogy written by uh, Basim al-Ansari, Ruqayya story. Let's read a lay story from a long history. In not far land and time, there happened a bad crime. There was a little girl, sweet and pure like April. Rokay as less than five, but she could not survive. Like any kid her age, she's yet to to write her page she used to enjoy fun play fully jump and run Rokay saw a lot in trail of the onslaught with family rich charm she was afraid though calm the prison became home after a long forced roam everyone was asleep when she started to weep I miss my dad Hussein 
Hussein. I miss my dad Hussein, not knowing he was slain. She cried for him so hard, caused Yazid to shout, God, take her father's cut head, take her father's cut head. She thought it's covered bread. I'm not hungry to feed for my dad I'm in need. God's uncovered the bull. The sin shook her fine soul. God's uncovered the bull. The sin shook her fine soul. She screamed from the pain. Is this you, my Hussein? Why your face is so pale? How can I bear your tail? I'm orphaned when still young. My fragile heart's now stung. She couldn't handle more. Sadness melted her core. She took her last warm breath. Hussein's darling face death. Hussein's darling face death. اللهم صل على محمد وعلى محمد وعلى فاطمة شكرا صلى الله عليه وسلم اسمعكم جزاكم الله خير سيدي